All right. Hey, everybody. I'm, uh, I don't know why it's like this, but we'll just go with it. I'm uh, Damien from Cantrust Hosting Co-op. Uh, we are a local worker cooperative, and we do managed web hosting and managed business app hosting. And uh, why we're giving this talk is we actually follow PERMA computing principles, and we do everything ourselves. So we host all of our stuff with open source software on our own servers. We don't use any third, par third parties, pardon me, or the cloud. And we follow PERMA computing principles as part of our triple bottom line approach. And so what I'm going to talk about today is um, some tips for self-hosting, which hopefully lots of you are interested in doing. Uh, and we've been doing it for 15 years and learned a lot of what to do and what not to do. So I'm just going to kind of blast through some tips, basically, for success. Uh, just talking about a little why self-host, because you can and you know you want to. Uh, because it's cheap, no mafia pricing. As you get more successful, you don't have an unexpected business partner saying, oh, we're just going to take a percentage tax on that. Um, because you're in control of your own data and you decide its fate. And because you're entitled to privacy. But if you want it, you've got to fight for it. So the problem is reliable long-term hosting is hard because the Internet's a very scary place. We have bots, we have hackers, but probably more dangerous than both of those is good old-fashioned human error. And uh, there's a big step up when you go from you know, messing around with your own project to actually providing infrastructure for your organization. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is that the stuff you need to do if you're going to actually provide this as a service, say for your family or for your company or for your club or whatever. So uh, I'm going to talk about four suggested safety nets for self-hosting. Uh, the first one being backups. The second one being using reliable hardware. The third one is to perform regular security patching. And the fourth one is to monitor the service and support it. Uh, so first off is backups. Um, pretty obvious one. Um, by far the most important thing that you have to get right. Um, incremental backups are the most useful if there's a crisis, and by that I mean backing up the individual files, not just like snapshotting the disk of the VM. Um, we really like our snapshot for this. It's a, a tool built on top of rsync, and it's totally wonderful. Uh, Off-site backups are a must, otherwise they're pointless. If your building burns down, the backup is useless. Um, if you don't have a second location to backup from, then you should consider just encrypting the data and dumping it in the cloud. Um, distasteful though the cloud is, it's way better than not having a backup. And at the end of the day, a reliable backup is more important than having high principles um, when everything's broken. Uh, offline and immutable backups are also helpful if you're worried about ransomware. And if you weren't run Windows at all, you should start worrying if you're not already. And lastly, really another really important point that a lot of people miss, backups are only reliable if you test them. So to test properly, it's really simple. You just do some role playing. You pretend whatever terrible scenario has happened, your building burned down, the server got ransomware, you had a rogue employee delete everything out of spite, whatever you want, and then you just kind of run through it. Um, kind of like people do with those like earthquake disaster drills. You just pretend it's happening and you go right till the end until everything's recovered and that's how you find the gaps. And you don't want to be doing that when it's actually happening for real. I absolutely assure you of that. It's no fun. Uh, number two I'm going to go into is use reliable server hardware. So this is another uh, easy mistake to make. Um, you know, just take the computer under the desk that's been great and, you know, it worked great for downloading stuff off BitTorrent. We'll use that for the server. Um, consumer hardware doesn't really tend to last in production, um, which you'll find out if you try and use it. Server hardware, on the other hand, is really reliable and built to never fail. Um, it's got redundant critical systems, so you've got dual power supply, you've got RAID for your hard drives. Um, it's got high reliability testing of all the components. So that's enterprise versus consumer grade drives, um, memory, everything. It's got lights out management, which basically means there's a little computer on another board in your server, and if your server croaks or reboots and gets stuck, or something like the CrowdStrike thing, you know, it's rebooting in a boot loop, you can actually connect into the little card and like connect to a virtual console and put in a firmware update on a USB, and that appears as a virtual device, and you can actually rescue stuff remotely most of the time. And a little more about the reliability is the server vendors make most of their money on service contracts. So if you go buy yourself a brand new server and you put it in your mission critical data center, you're also going to buy the service contract. And if you could really afford it, you buy the like four hour service contract. And then if anything breaks, you just phone them and some guy appears out of a helicopter and comes down the long line and runs into the data center and fixes it no matter what's wrong and you're back up and running within four hours and that's what you paid for. So it makes sense if the server vendors know this, they just make everything super reliable and they never actually have to do that and then they rake in the extra money. 
And that's why they're so much more reliable. It's not really a, it's really a case of they decided to do better because it was in their financial best interests, which is a whole side discussion on planned obsolescence and everything else. But yeah, so that's the big reason to go with servers. And the last couple points are lightly used server hardware is actually really cheap. Um, you can really kit yourself out for under a thousand bucks usually. And uh, it's fun to upgrade. That's what I got a little picture of on the right there is a little CPU swap. And uh, there's a really good source of info on all of this stuff for server hardware, and that is the home lab thread on Reddit, which is just amazing. Any questions you might have for any level of this, uh, that's the best place to get your answer. All right, number three, security patching. This should be obvious to everyone. Um, a common mistake people make is they do this for a while, and then like something breaks or goes wrong, and you can't get it to work anymore, and so they just stop, and then just hope nothing goes wrong. And sometimes that works permanently, but not usually. Um, if you're doing your own hosting right down to the bare metal, you've got more patching than you're used to. At the cloud, you really only have to about worry about the top layer here, patching your software as a service you're providing. But doing it yourself, you also have to patch your container layer, um, which is like your server, so your Linux or your Docker uh, containers or whatever. You also have to patch the bare metal OS slash hypervisor. That's a really popular thing this year is uh, VMware ESXi hypervisor escape attacks. As soon as VMware pretty much tanked all the small customers and changed the licensing model, all the hackers started writing software specifically for that. So if you've got all these backups and stuff, it's no good if someone owns your, old, your own hypervisor, takes the whole thing, and the backups run another VM on there. And then uh, last thing is you've also got to worry about the hardware. So there's patches for your hardware too. There's firmware updates. There's a new Intel speculative execution thing every month that you're going to have to deal with. And this last one's kind of tricky if you like to rock the old hardware, because Intel doesn't want you running that old hardware. They want you to buy a new server, so they stop making the updates. So in some cases, you've got to look at additional mitigations. Um, for instance, turning off hyperthreading, because it was never going to work in the first place. Last thing is service monitoring. So uh, if you're going to provide all this stuff as a service, you really don't want your users letting you know that stuff's broken. Um, it really bums everyone out. And especially when people are doing things like emailing or file sharing, we've all been conditioned by the cloud to expect that stuff to be reliable and always working. And so people get pretty upset when it isn't. Um, so what you need to do is, first of all, know before the users. Um, I said here, uptime is critically important for some services, for example, email. Um, there are ways to make email keep working if the email server goes down, but it requires multiple points of presence. And uh, if it does go down, you might start having email bounce, and that also really upsets people. Um, so you need to monitor your services not just from inside your house, but also from an external location, or you're not going to really know if it's down for everybody else. And uh, fortunately, there's a lot of free cloud tools that do this, like Uptime Robot and similar things. Um, they're really easy to use, and they're cheap and free. And then the very last thing here is uh, planning your scheduled maintenance. So if you you know, we do every Thursday night at 10 p.m. is when our maintenance window is, and we tell everyone to expect, if you see weird downtime after that, don't call us. And that is it for my little blurb, so hopefully useful info for people. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. If people have them, just commandeer me outside. Yeah. Thank you.